Hi there, I'm Nafisa Salatic. In 2021, across the Balkans covered conflict crisis and examined the fault lines shaping Southeast Europe today. To do that, we had several prominent figures on our show to discuss the region's most pressing issues. In this special episode, we'll bring you highlights from some of our strongest interviews this year. Let's start with Bosnia and Herzegovina, the country still suffering politically since the end of Bosnian war. The Dayton peace deal ended the bloodshed in 1995, but it hasn't worked to end the country's ethnic divisions. The nation now faces the biggest threat to its survival since then, as one man, Milorad Dodik, leads the push for a possible breakup. Back in March, I spoke to Dodik, then chairperson of Bosnia and Herzegovina's presidency, and I asked why he insists on independence for Serbs within the country. Those are things that are necessary to solve in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would like to do a deal between Bosnia, Serbs and Croatia, the one who is necessary to Bosnia and Herzegovina will be stable. If that deal is not possible, then, of course, Šta je drugo preostaje nego da se narodi, koristeći određene svoje prava, mogu da jedna od alternativa naravno i da se podijele, odnosno raziđu i da žive u miru. Mir je primarna riječ, odnosno i najvažnija riječ na Balkan. Bosna i Hercegovina žive u miru i to je veoma važno. Dakle... Wow, divide, disperse and live in peace. You were also talking about a peaceful breakup of Bosnia and Herzegovina a few weeks ago in the parliament of Republika Srpska. How do you think Bosniaks and Croats would react if you went ahead with that? Pa moralo bi se da opet sam rekao da se treba da se dogovaraju narodi unutra. Dakle, nema ništa unilateralno ovde. To je samo jedna od mogućnosti koja bi došla na kraju svih neiskorištenih mogućnosti. Dakle, u pogledu toga to treba i tomačiti. Dakle, mi nikakvu akciju tamo ne pokrićemo, niti se ta akcija vodi, ali se razmišlja i o tim krajnjim mogućnostima ukoliko se ne dođe do aranžmana koji je omogućava da Bosna i Hercegovina bude na zadovoljstvo svih naroda u okviru koji žive u Bosni i Hercegovini. Poznato je danas da u federaciji veoma je izražen sukob između bošnjačke političke elite i hrvatske političke elite. U federaciji vlada, federacija nije formirana nakon izbora ni evo dvije godine i više. I u tom pogledu, apsolutno se govori o tome, odnosno to samo govori o tome da postoje određene stvari koje treba biti riješene i nije dovoljno osloniti se na međunarodni intervencionizam kako to najčešće čine bošnjaci i čekati da oni poravnaju stvari. Naravno, to se neće desiti. Ja pozivam na dogovor. Ako dogovora nema, onda što drugo preostaje. You were there negotiating the Dayton Agreement on behalf of Bosnian delegation. And more than 25 years later, even today, the representatives of three ethnic groups still have very different positions on how Bosnia's future should look like. Uh, what do you think needs to happen to make this country function like any other country uh, in Europe? What we need to do in Bosnia and Herzegovina is for these ethnic groups become citizens again. The ethnic groups were imposed, the ethnic principle was imposed by genocide in Bosnia. We should go back to normal. But unfortunately there is more injustice, so you, can, you cannot heal the country with more injustice. We need some justice, we need some normalcy here. We need to go back to citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, not the ethnic groups. We were never ethnic groups here. This is the old, plural country. Right, and what yeah. would your advice be to the Bosnian leaders that are in power at the moment, especially to those representing Bosniaks? Well, uh, to use now the initiatives that are prob probably coming from the United States of America, from Europe, to really create citizens Bosnia. This experiment imposed on us by genocide again, has failed miserably. We have a beautiful country, a rich country, but we need some justice here, some normalcy, and the attention of the international community. 
uh, until the last minute, uh, survivors were worried that the justice would not be served. I have spoken personally with some of them. Uh, one of them even told me, I was afraid, quote, I was afraid until the end that he will walk free. Uh, why was there a lack of trust um, in the justice system until the end? When tribunal was formed in 1993, it was the time when the war in Bosnia Herzegovina was really uh, 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 being very severe, and especially towards the victims. And as we all know, the victims in Bosnia Herzegovina were uh, uh, overwhelmingly uh, Bosnian Muslims group that was chosen uh, because of their. Uh, national, ethnic, and religious identity. And at that time, international community had a choice to stop Serb aggression by military intervention, which all of us, people in the West, were actually demanding from our governments. They chose not to stop Serbs at this point of the war, and they formed instead a tribunal promising the people that everyone who was committing a crime would be put before the court, court of justice, and be held responsible. So it diverted attention from political diplomatic responsibility that the international community, and I mostly mean West here, took upon themselves. So if you think about this momentum, that in May 93, all these people who were suffering so much then were told, times will change and all those uh, people who were harming you now will be uh, held responsible. Not only the tribunal did not deter Serbs from committing the crimes, don't forget Srebrenica happened two and a half years later in summer 95, so tribunal couldn't stop by itself what politicians and diplomats or military uh, couldn't, uh, uh, were not at that time prepared to do. So you can see actually this postponement of people who suffered to get justification uh, of retribution, that those who did harm were, were uh, punished. And now, after 28 years that this tribunal was formed, there is a very bitter taste of tribunal's justice because not only that some of the verdicts were extremely disappointing. I will just mention you one of them. In 2013, General Momchilo Perisic, who was a, a commander of um, Vojska Yugoslavia and superior to Ratko Mladic, walked free. He was uh, acquitted of all charges in his indictment. And Mladic, before Mladic's judgment, there was a huge concern that something very non-legal, unexpected, politicized might happen and that Ratko Mladic would walk free. Chances for this were very, uh, very slim, but the fact that victims after 28 years waiting for some sort of justice had that fear in their mind, exactly. tell enough what was the trust and what has been the trust in a tribunal's type of justice, which is retributive justice. It punishes, it prosecutes and punishes individuals. One of the biggest news stories this year was the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, which prompted thousands of asylum seekers to flee and worsened the refugee situation in the Balkans. Several nations were quick to offer assistance with temporary housing, like Albania. But we uncovered evidence that authorities in both Croatia and Greece illegally pushed people back at their borders. Both governments deny the allegations despite moving ahead with tougher migration policies. Here is how two experts assessed the situation. Well, the findings that we know are based on the testimonies received from the people. Uh, we are in the communication with the organizations working in Bosnia, uh, but also people are contacting us on our official telephone line, uh, where people uh, are actually asking for the support to access the asylum system. Uh, 
the accusations uh, mentioning violence and brutal behavior of the Croatian police towards the people are uh, present for several years. Uh, of course, from time to time, the, the type of the violence, the method change, but we still haven't seen any consequences of uh, the, the acts that are uh, being said. So uh, we, what we actually are uh, asking from the government and from the European Commission is that uh, there are consequences for the people that are doing uh, those br brutal actions from the people on, uh, towards the people on the border. Right. Because as we can see at the moment on, on, the, um, on the television from the footage that you have, it's uh, vulnerable groups, it's women, it's children, it's elderly people, and uh, they're living in unhuman conditions. Uh, and yeah, maybe we can talk a bit more about the system in Bosnia, but yeah, the, the current situation is not getting any better and uh, we right. do not see uh, right. any, any uh, statement from the uh, authorities. Today we are experiencing uh, the construction and the inauguration of new larger multi-purpose facilities with a double uh, barbed wire fencing, surveillance cameras and towers. The first example was in Samos. Recently we had the inauguration of two other centers in Kos and Leros, and there are more to come. They are called, they are called of, uh, controlled uh, movement centers. But from our perspective and how it's been experienced by the people, they are prison-like centers. We see a model that, although it was implemented, it was inhumane by Moria a year ago and was always destroyed, to be copied and reproduced in new locations, the narrative and the setup of similar situation and centers as it was in Moria, and we knew how was the situation. Right. They're building centers only to trap people, and to create an inhumane situation and undignified uh, policy of reception for the people who arrive in the islands. And give us more details about how exactly uh, these camps work. What's the procedure to get inside and how does it work? So upon arrival on any Greek island, the Greek authorities will uh, take you to this facility in order to start having uh, the beginning of your registration work and your documentation. And normally you should go through asylum procedures of entering in Greece where the Greek authorities, the asylum service, will assess if you are, have, you are admissible for asylum in Greece or not. And then based on this decision, further steps are to be followed. The mentality from these uh, centers, though by the Greek government implemented, is to keep people and deter them from being in the city centers of the islands and being integrated or having access to humane conditions. The, in principle, they should have access to all the services in the center and they should remain there until the asylum process is completed. Including COVID restrictions as they're implementing everywhere, you can imagine that the free movement of people from those centers has been prohibited and hindering the process. And it's not as open as it should be or dignified in the process. Across the Balkans gave particular attention this year to Montenegro. We covered everything from religious protests in Cetinje to economic uncertainty and political tension and even the dangerous underworld of drug cartels. 2021 saw police pull off the biggest drug bust in the region's history when they seized more than a ton of cocaine in a shipment of bananas. I interviewed the man behind the successful operation, Deputy Prime Minister Dritan Abazovic, who vowed his nation will no longer be a land of crime. This is the uh, biggest catching of cocaine in the history of the Balkan, and that's happened in the end of the August. It's, uh, we're talking about 1.4 tons, so 1,400 kilograms of cocaine, uh, which in the trade market it's uh, more than 100 uh, millions of euros. So uh, nobody knows what's happened exactly in the, in the Balkan cartels, but uh, I can promise and I can say very clearly that new government of Montenegro have a strong wish and strong will to just uh, finally 
uh, fight against every kind of, of, of uh, organized crime in the country and uh, narco cartels are uh, most dangerous and most problematic. We starting immediately after we uh, come to the, to the, to the position, uh, immediately start to uh, make our operation. When we talk with our international partners, they say that we will need uh, between 18 and 20, uh, 24 months to prepare our uh, services to start to fight against organized uh, criminal groups in the country, but we're doing that after four months. After four months, we have first operation against the narco boss in, 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 in the country when we arrested one of two biggest narco boss uh, in Montenegro. And after that, in the end of the summer, is, it was this action which we talk about, about cocaine. In that action, we actually arrested two persons which are not in the, in the, in the top of the pyramid but uh, they can be useful for the for the for the um, further uh, investigation so we're doing this with international partners we should know that no, uh, especially no montenegro which is very small uh, can not do nothing without uh, international cooperation of police and we are very thankful to everybody especially to europol and to uh, us dea and another another partners who are working very strongly and very closely with us to right. uh, stopping the smuggling of drugs in this part of the world. Uh, Montenegro and some other countries in the region, uh, primarily Serbia, have been uh, shaken recently by scandals about possible links between security agencies and criminal organizations. We have seen a couple of arrests in Montenegro recently. Uh, what did your investigation into this reveal? Uh, were you able to prove the connection of some high-ranking officials in Montenegro with the criminal gangs? Uh, can you give us more details uh, about those links? Yes, this is, this is, the, this is the key problem. So, uh, we cannot have organized crime without support of the of the political elites. So they have a very strong networking. Some of the organized criminal groups are more powerful than some state institutions. They have more money, more logistic, uh, very very good networking. And uh, in another side is the uh, state, which don't have too much economical economical, uh, very, very low economical level of, of, of support of security services uh, with a lack of, let's say, uh, good techniques and, and, and good technology to fight against them. And uh, um, that was created for the, for the 30 years in our country. So we didn't have the political changes for the last 30 years. And it was very normal to have a lot of politicizing of, of, of different institution. I don't want to say that everybody are connected with organized crime, but uh, definitely, definitely one part of organized crime have the protection of the state before. Right. And now what we are trying to fight and co to combine, this is the key battle for us, to, to just uh, uh, stop any kind of influence to organize criminal groups to the institution. If we come to that point, I think that we will have more and more this kind of successful action in the in the in the in the in the future but definitely in the past uh, they operating because they find the uh, very good environment political environment for the for the making of this kind of business in, in montenegro it's not only about smuggling of drugs uh, problem in montenegro is very huge problem is the smuggling of uh, cigarettes it's uh, another, another parts, par, parts of criminality and uh, we want to stop that. Friction between Montenegro's new ruling majority and the opposition since last year's election has slowed down reforms. This coalition came to power after ousting Milo Djukanovic and his party after 30 years. It's Montenegro's first government comprised mostly of non-politically affiliated experts. One of those experts is the Minister of Economy, Jakov Milatovic. I sat down with him to ask how fragile he thinks his government is. Montenegro got the new government last December. Uh, after about 30 years of, uh, of the rule of uh, basically more or less one party. And uh, so what is currently going on in Montenegro is, uh, you know, a normal sort of a democratic uh, transition of power. Uh, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, and uh, and uh, as you rightly said, I think that uh, what is kind of you know currently going on is uh, sort of a discussion between the prime minister 
and uh, a number of MPs from the parliamentary majority uh, who want to reassess the success uh, of the past 10 months of the government and uh, we are currently having a discussion about it. So as in every country uh, which you know is a kind of is a democracy there are discussions on uh, you know whether something should be strengthened within the government or not and that's exactly what is currently going on in Montenegro. As I said uh, Montenegro is a, is a small uh, is a small country that uh, last December got uh, a new government as a result of the elections that uh, the country had in August last year. Uh, it's, uh, it's the country which currently goes through a sort of a democratic uh, transition. Uh, it's a good thing. So you're confident that this government will survive? Well, absolutely. I think, you know, this government uh, will for sure survive uh, in, you know, in, in one or another form. Uh, it can uh, sort of a be strengthened and I think you know that's uh, that's uh, exactly what is currently going on within the discussions uh, between the Prime Minister and the MPs of the parliamentary majority. It's a sort of a, just a normal thing uh, that, uh, that any democratic country uh, you know can have and uh, with uh, you know the whole aim of uh, strengthening the the position of the government uh, and uh, and sort of a you know, providing a certain, uh, uh, you know, additional reform, uh, reform, reform agenda to the government uh, with the aim to make uh, a relationship between the government and the parliament a more functioning one so that, the, so that the government can actually deliver on a very ambitious reform agenda that this government has. The world continued to grapple with COVID-19 this year, especially in the Balkans. Many countries suffered from slow vaccine rollouts and low vaccination rates, like Romania, while others, like Croatia, were hurt economically with the loss of tourism. But one country, Serbia, led the way with one of the world's fastest vaccination rates at the start of year. In March, I spoke to the Serbian Health Ministry's State Secretary to ask how Belgrade achieved this. We've been preparing to start vaccinations since April and we've created an excellent system. First of all, thanks to our President Aleksandar Vucic, who launched bilateral negotiations with many countries in the world and used his authority and personal contacts, we first managed to get a sufficient number of vaccines, millions of doses, because without vaccines, we couldn't carry out mass immunization. Secondly, our well-designed healthcare system helped a lot. We included private healthcare facilities, emergency centers, secondary hospitals, and clinics. An electronic IT system has also been created to invite all citizens to receive a jab. It schedules the exact date, time and location for vaccination. So every citizen gets a vaccine in about 10 to 15 minutes. It was organized in such a way that we haven't seen any problems. We've managed to vaccinate 60 to 70,000 citizens a day. Uh, why is Romania struggling to tackle the COVID crisis so much? There are several factors. Uh, foremost, uh, the political interference into the mitigation uh, effort. Uh, Romania had done very, very well in the first wave when uh, the mitigation was controlled strictly by uh, medical doctors and uh, public health uh, experts. But in the fourth wave, uh, this uh, completely uh, changed towards uh, the political control and the political decision of the what measures can be taken and what measures cannot. Also, the vaccination uh, efforts started very well in Romania, but again, uh, once the politicians started to uh, communicate and tell people what to do and not to do, and especially when they took uh, complete relaxation measure in, in the summer while all the other Europe was vaccinating, we uh, uh, were the most relaxed country in Europe and at one point the most uh, relaxed country in uh, the world uh, according to the, the Economist Index of uh, uh, Return to Normalcy. Are you confident that it's safe to come and visit your city at the moment? Absolutely. Uh, more than 90% of uh, tourist workers are already vaccinated with uh, two shots. 53% uh, of uh, Dubrovnik population is already vaccinated. 
We are continuing with the vaccination uh, every week and uh, considering the number of COVID positive cases, currently we have just three persons that are COVID positive in Dubrovnik. Uh, so Dubrovnik is a really safe uh, destination and we want to keep that safety, uh, of course, uh, through the vaccination of uh, local population, but also keeping a social distance as uh, much as we can uh, in hoping to get more and more tourists, uh, like things are really go going to uh, are going in good direction in Dubrovnik. Right. right. Uh, there are fears with the new variants emerging uh, now again, and critics say it's too early to fully reopen. What would you say to them? It's always, there are always going to be a new variations. Uh, now it's a Delta. Uh, a few months ago, it was a, a British sort of coronavirus. Uh, next, maybe month or two, we will have new sorts. Uh, so what we have to do is, of course, uh, be vaccinated as number one, keep distance as number second, and things will be okay. I'm absolutely confident that uh, uh, with uh, this uh, being responsible, uh, we can keep things under control and we can continue in recovering with tourist operations. I'm uh, very, very happy that uh, after uh, now more than one year, Turkish Airlines uh, is uh, going to continue and uh, they restart uh, their operations uh, to Dubrovnik Airport uh, this week. Thanks for watching this special edition of Across the Balkans featuring highlights from our coverage in 2021. From all of us here in Istanbul, we wish you a happy new year. Sretna Nova Godina. Here's to a peaceful and prosperous 2022. See you next time. Bye-bye for now.